Normally when I do this, I'm in a pure leisure environment and I show lots of high action shots of me competing in my sport, which is long distance triathlon. But I wasn't going to be so vain today because it's a slightly different audience. Aspire, what's in a name? Actually, it's, we're a bit like Treat. It, that's not really our name. We made that one up because our real name is the Association of Spinal Injury Research, Rehabilitation and Reintegration. Uh, it's great, isn't it? They have people come up with these slick acronyms from ridiculously wrong, long names that try to describe every single thing you do. So just going to try and give you a little bit of background actually to what is that we do. So research, we have, this is another great one. I'm really glad that my guys came up with an acronym for this. So we have the ASPAR Center for Rehabilitation Engineering and Assistive Technology in the Institute of Orthopedics and Musculoskeletal Science, part of the Faculty of Medicine and Interventional Science, University College London. And they came up with the acronym ASPAR CREATE. Thank you. Um, so we work in rehabilitation engineering. It's mostly implantable devices, robotics, exoskeletal um, devices. Amazing work, about 25 strong academics. That's boosted to 34 in the new year. Rehabilitation, well, we have uh, the Aspar Leisure Centre. So we no longer call it the Aspar National Training Centre because really it's, it deals with rehabilitation and it is pretty much purely a leisure centre. Uh, I think it was a slight misleading intention by the Board of Trustees when they set the thing up years and years ago. Um, and we do a thing called the of Technology that trains people with limited or no upper limb function to access computers, tablets, smartphones, um, environmental controls in the home and so on. Uh, but we do that and we deliver that throughout the UK and all the spinal centres. Um, and then reintegration, we have a whole series of national services that we deliver from um, temporary housing, our target's 100, we've got 48 just now and we're well on track to deliver that where we provide a temporary home for someone being discharged from hospital until their own home. As Mel's just told, her, her house was completely inaccessible. Well, actually the vast majority of people who are fortunate not to be discharged into a care home, that's one in five, the others tend to find themselves in completely inaccessible properties where they may in fact be prisoner in their own front room with nothing more than a hospital bed, a commode, these days a 50-inch 50, 50 um, smart television and, you know, your life's not your own anymore. Most people can't even get through their own living room door, never mind out the front door. So that's what we do. We've got independent living advisors throughout the UK, benefits advice, all sorts of stuff, but this is all specifically targeting and supporting spinal cord injured people. So we built a leisure centre. So why would a spinal cord injury charity build a leisure centre? It is a bit bizarre, but there was very good reason. About 38 years ago, Stan Ward was boasting the new London Spinal Centre, which was a state-of-the-art um, uh, spinal centre, but they were sharing the rehabilitation um, services in the occupational therapy and physiotherapy as part of the main hospital. If you've ever been to Stan Ward, it's a site where in um, 43 AD the Romans declared they had conquered England. That's why Stan Ward's so famous. They never got to Scotland, they never conquered us. Anyway, they just built a silly wall thinking they could keep us out, never mind. Um, so the, the, the original concept was to provide dedicated physio and occupational health. So they thought, let's build a building that we can have this just for spinal injury patients. Terrific idea. Um, but modelled on the uh, work or, of Sir Ludwig Goodman and the first ever Paralympic Games in 1980, uh, 1948, um, they thought, let's have a sports centre as well, perhaps a little gym, and um, that way we can engage spinal injury patients in more social interaction rather than this one-to-one -one phase with a physiotherapist or an occupational therapist learning very functional movement or activity or learning how to cope in different environments. Um, as I say, uh, the assistive technology program, actually we trained people that we thought, well, if you've just fallen off a roof as, as, a, as a roofer, you're not going to return to that in, as a permanent wheelchair user. So, and back in those days, we were really pioneering with the old 386s and floppy disks. Remember them? We've come a long way, haven't we? Um, when I tell staff this on inductions and you've got young people and you're saying, Actually, Facebook didn't exist 10 years ago. And I go, what? 
because for some people in this world, they've never known anything apart from iPads and Facebook. But yeah, so we used to train people how to use computers, thinking we could reskill them so that they can, because we thought, actually, computers, this is the future. We think this, is, this has got some legs. This is going to go somewhere. Um, we, had, um, we eventually, in, in phase two part of the building, so our building was built, built in two phases. I'm going to tell you a little bit more of that, but in a bit. We had a, an accessible dance studio, which then became home to the internationally um, famous inclusive dance company, Kanduku, who uh, performed at the opening and closing ceremonies, both at Beijing and at London. And I have no doubt they're going to turn up at some part of the ceremonies in Rio as well. Um, amazing. I've seen every performance I've ever put together. I don't really get contemporary dance. I think it's admirable what they do, but I turn up to everyone going, oh, I don't really, yeah, hmm, all these funny movements, never mind. It's a bit like daddy dancing gone really horribly wrong sometimes. <laughs> um, and I can do that really good. Um, and it was going to be a home for the charity. So it was somewhere that we could build um, a place, offices for us, and we could start you know, building beyond just this physical environment. So let's have a look at what we built. It's not too dissimilar to um, what, we, what we've just been looking at. But um, it is, this is the newer part of the building um, that was designed by uh, Lord Foster so, and Foster and Partners. And they gave all of their services free of charge, donated, I think it was probably almost close to a million pounds worth of services. I'm not sure they got it quite right. They're not specialists in leisure center um, design, but there we go. We had a very limited footprint. So let's just look at the other part. If I show you this, that was the earlier part which contains the sports hall. And you can see the new, the new area with the swanky glass and aluminium with the typical signature tune of um, uh, Norman Foster. Um, that was this summer, so it's grass is looking pretty awful. Uh, we don't get the same um, precipitation levels that you get here, obviously, do we? Um, now, the original building was designed by this gentleman here, Andrew Walker, who is uh, well, was a um, paraplegic architect. Um, he was also a patient at Stanmore. And when the whole concept was pulled together, he said, well, I'd love to design it. Came up with really radical things. This is before part time building regulations for accessible design had even been thought of. This is before the Disability Discrimination Act. And he designed a building that was free of physical barriers, that was set at such an accessible standard that it's still not being replicated. A toilet is just a toilet. It's not gender specific and it's not disability specific. We all have physical needs. When you need to go, you just want to find a toilet and go. You don't have to go and get a key with a tire connected to it that you have to get from a reception and then you discover the toilet's actually the other side of the building. Like, Tell you what, it's too late. You know, I just need to go home and clean myself up. You know, it's just. You know, it's just common sense. And this is back in the mid-80s. Phenomenal, really. So I'm going to introduce you to uh, a friend of mine called Nate. I call him a friend because one of his best friends is uh, 50 Cent. Some of you are probably looking saying, who's 50 Cent? Who's he? Uh, he's a rapper, American guy. Yeah. Anyway, Nick was spinally injured. I met him when he was injured um, about 16 years ago. and. Um, Part of his occupational therapy was he had to practice a certain hand movement. So he thought, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I, I could actually practice writing. And I've got an idea. I've always fancied writing a script for a movie. Um, people on the wards thought, you're writing a script for a movie. But this guy was a martial, high, highly qualified martial artist and bodyguard to Lennox Lewis. That means he's scary. I mean, a body. Lennox Lewis needs a bodyguard. I mean, you need someone who is really feisty. Um, anyway, he, um, he wrote the script. He got it backed. He produced it. He's now done two films, both multi-award winning. Last one featured 50 Cent in the film La uh, Dead Man Running. So you may have heard of it. Great guy. Anyway, Nick's going to take us into the Aspar National Training Center, as it was then, now the Aspar Leisure Center. So this is our main reception. Um, this is Chris, one of our receptionists, spinal cord injury, in his mid-50s, not exactly your stereotypical receptionist in the leisure uh, industry. 
Um, mm -hmm. But he was, he's brilliant. I had um, a, a group of people from another um, leisure um, trust come and visit, and they said, he's got such a fantastic manner. He, that guy's great. And I said, he wasn't always like that. He was a nightmare when he started, but it's about investing time in people. So we have what you're aspiring towards, no pun intended, aspiring towards. Um, we have this amazing 25 meter pool and a 20 meter wheelchair ramp. Our customers, if you're a wheelchair user, you can just transfer into a pool access chair, which is just a high quality shower chair, wheel yourself in, wheel yourself out. When you get into the water, you've got all that support with, with the water, 20 times denser than air. Get on, I mean, sometimes you're in a pool. How can you tell if someone's disabled? You just can. It's not unusual for our pool to have prosthetic limbs at one end of the pool. And here at the beginning of the ramp, you'll find a whole collection. If you ever want to steal crutches and walking sticks, <laughs> our pool's a place to do it. You'll have a massive collection of them there. And you know what? The vast majority, we monitored it for a day. Over 95% of customers enter and exit using the ramp. And that doesn't mean that they're all disabled. It's just the most dignified and comfortable way. You know, we have a growing epidemic of obesity. That actually deters most people from one of the most beneficial body weight supporting exercises, swimming, because of the size. Whether it's embarrassment or it's the lack of physical upper body strength to hoist yourself out of steps on the side of a pool. Think about it, it just makes sense. Let's go on to the gym. Um, oh, it's Nick. He still pumps on. He wants to be at the, uh, the games in Japan in 2020. So he's um, training now, powerlifting. He thought it was going to be really easy. It's not. When he discovered that actually people are smaller than him and they push massive weight to ratio power, it's just incredible. Athletes are finely tuned and he's finding it difficult to get to this standard. He's a huge guy. Um, Oh, he's still there working out. I mean, we can't <laughs> ever get rid of him. Um, but interestingly, most of our fitness professional staff are disabled. And I, I've got a few, couple of video clips that are a bit amateurish, but I have got some so I can introduce you to some, some of our team. Um, but the wonderful thing about our center is directly above this gym is the OT and Physio Rehabilitation Department there is operated by the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital. It's not just them that bring customers, uh, customers, patients, into the gym environment. It's actually the rest of the hospital. They run an active back program where they get people who are suffering from chronic back pain that sign a contract to say, I'm gonna come and I'm gonna do two weeks intensive work with physios and OTs to learn how to better manage posture, how I can move about and not cause aggravation, how I can actually do things to help strengthen my core stability. So every day I see members of the, um, the therapy department in there with patients and what a seamless transition to think. I mean you've got a huge opportunity here to be working from Morrison Hospital taking patients into a natural gym environment because most hospital physio departments are nothing like reality when you're discharged. Actually, going to a gym can be horribly scary. Sports hall, right, we don't actually fill it with high quality athletes, all permanent wheelchair users. We have a wide range. Our centre is actually used by a disproportionately high percentage of elderly, people who have more time. The Grey Pound has immense power, and yet most leisure operators target a certain social economic market that alienates elderly, what we refer to as the deconditioned market, I mean people who aren't fit or perhaps overweight, that could best benefit from this, and yet the people who cause the biggest cost to the NHS are exactly the people who are alienated by this sort of environment. Everything we do within the centre is absolutely 100% inclusive. If we can't make it inclusive, we don't do it. So if we can't, such as this, um, this young guy on a thing called a crank cycle, uh, we worked with Johnny G, I'm sure you're all familiar with Johnny G, who is the um, endurance cyclist, American, if you've ever met him, he's crazy, 
well, it's typical American. And um, he came up with the concept of spinning. You know, everyone thought it was mad. It would never take off. What you want people on stationary bikes in a class environment? How is that ever going to work? Well, he sold that business, and he came. We we got in touch with him and said, "We've heard about your work on cranking. Let's make it wheelchair accessible." So that's exactly what he did. So you've got a seat that can actually be locked on there, and then just lifted off, and it's fully wheelchair accessible. Again, simple concepts. Everything from circuit training. Um, we do a thing called clubber size um, to yoga. You name it. Every single exercise we do is inclusive. I don't know why Eon's standing up to take this. It's supposed to be seated exercise class, and he's leaping about like butts. Our gym does actually have unique equipment that you will not generally find in a leisure facility gym. Sue was diagnosed with um, MS over 20 years ago, and she was told that about the importance and the great value of regular exercise in maintaining her good health and well-being. Um, well-being, she just loves the gym. It's, it's become a sort of, the number of times I have to walk through and actually tell some of my staff off because she'll consume their time, chatting to them about all sorts of things, but she's just amazing. Um, Brian, Brian was diagnosed with MS. Sorry, it's just that this one morning I went down there and it was, these guys were just there, so I got photographs of them. Um, Brian travels for two hours to get to us. That's not unusual. Him and his wife researched the entire south of England trying to find a facility where he could benefit from the piece of equipment that Soup is on, which is functional electrical uh, stimulation cycle. So it's artificially stimulated paralyzed muscles. The benefit is that without the stimulation and ability to fire and activate muscle, they just waste away. And of course, muscle is the only engine in a human body that burns calories. So guess what happens? If, you can't, if muscle wastes and you keep consuming, you just balloon, you get fatter, threat of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, you know the, the routine. But with someone who becomes spinal injury and injured, the secondary th threat is you could develop pressure sores. You develop a pressure sore, you're under threat of septicemia, they will kill you. Or three months in hospital, another huge cost to the NHS, just so that you, they, they can allow that injury to be healed. Let's introduce you to our staff. I'm going to do this quickly. Um, Liz has been um, with us for over 25 years. She's a, a registered general nurse. She's highly qualified in rehabilitation in every dynamic you can ever think, whether it's cardiac rehab, cancer rehab, the whole lot, the whole shebang. Um, Graham's been with us uh, 20 years, 15 of those was, uh, he came to do work experience with us and uh, we trained him to become a fitness professional and he's now working for himself as a personal trainer. Um, he's possibly still the only highly qualified spin instructor, Schwinn instructor and cranking instructor. Um, and his classes are hugely popular. Eon, you've already seen, he's our head looking after all of our inclusive class program. And this is one of our latest recruits. Can, we'll just give him a proper picture. That's David hanging from the bars, just showing you that anything is possible, even if you are paralyzed and a permanent wheelchair user. You know, he'll do chin-ups all day long, if, but he's supposed to be working, so we don't pay him just to do chin-ups in the gym. Hi, my name's Eon Walters. Um, I walked in the door 16 years ago and thought, I have to work here. I'll probably still be here at 70 if I can be. Aspire is, is the first facility of its kind in Europe, and I don't see why anybody should be anywhere else. Hi, I'm Graham. I've worked here at Aspire for 20 years. The last four years have been as a self-employed personal trainer. The good thing about the Aspire Leisure Centre is it's completely inclusive for disabled and non-disabled users. My name's Sue Carnell. I've been coming here for over 20 years. Um, it's been a lifeline for me, and uh, I'd be lost without it. My name is Brian Wilson. I'm 67 year old, first and southern, multiple sclerosis. We were fortunate to have found it, and it is the only affordable gym in England. My name is Elizabeth Board. Oh, I love this centre. Um, people have been here for 25 years. It actually feels like one of the family. I've been a member of Aspire since my accident. I 
I mean, eleven years ago. When I was first at my entry, I was in the spiral unit in Stanmore. And when I saw the likes of Graham, who's actually in a wheelchair, one of the trainers here, it inspired me to want to train. At Aspire, I had been a physics instructor for approximately six months. Um, so really, I have probably a better life now than what I did. And, you know, that's, a lot of it was by coming to a leisure centre like this that really helped me out. And probably it's helped me out in more ways than I can probably really <coughs> think of. Just before I, I, I go on to, to cover this, um, the story about David Morphew, the fitness instructor, has just been with us six months. I found him in the corridor. He was, he'd come back in for two weeks intensive physio because of uh, a, a recovery of function in, in his, his legs after his injury. He was completely depressed. He was a millionaire who used to live in Spain. He, was, uh, he had a specialist flooring business. He had a stable of cars. He had loads of properties. He lost the whole lot after his accident because he was unable to continue to work. He returned to the UK and I found him in the corridor and he was suffering with chronic depression. And then I discovered that one of his passions was actually working out. He used to do bodybuilding when he was a teenager. So I said, why don't you train to become a fitness professional? I can't believe he's now working for us. So it's sheer fluke. He went through this program. I'll tell you about it at the very end. Um, but amazing guy, it really has. When he says to people, I'm in a much better place now, his life used to be full of materiality, things he took for granted every day. Now he just loves his life. A little bit of background uh, about disability in society. So approximately 19% of society is disabled. That is a huge number. And yet, 17% of that population are born disabled. So the absolute vast majority of us become, of the disabled people in society, become disabled in their lifetime. This was from very, some of the most recent research from the NHS that highlighted that one in four people in society are living with one or more um, chronic life, lifelong conditions. And that is a shocker. 98% of us will become disabled in our lifetime. Now, when I give this lecture to um, people in the leisure industry, I normally give everyone color cards so that they, they get an indication just within the room what that percentage looks like. And then at the end of it, I'll say, OK, if you are not disabled and you are able to stand up, will you please stand up? And when you say to them, statistically, this is the number of people in the room who will become disabled in a lifetime. None of them are disabled. That's the leisure industry. It's not operated by disabled people, for disabled people. They have no comprehension. Before we um, came up with a, a, an idea about how we could start to export some of our uh, knowledge and expertise, we came up with a, an idea. We created two fictitious characters, try and do this quickly, both fitness instructors, and we sent out 297 applications across the entire UK. So you're included in that, Wales. We did Scotland as well. Countries tried to wriggle out of it, saying, no, 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 we must be better than that. And um, so we, we sent both applications to every single job. And this is what happened. So if you declare one of them, both applicants had the exact same um, skills, qualifications, and experience, but one declared that they were a permanent wheelchair user. And this was the result. So twice as likely, 100% more outright rejections that they didn't get offered, um, they didn't get offered an interview. Now, I think most organizations have forgotten about the two ticks positive about employing people, that if they are qualified, you're, you've signed up to uh, a policy that says that you will give them an interview. And yet the, the non-wheelchair user was four times more likely to get invited to interview. There's no difference between the two candidates. They're exactly the same, but one didn't declare if they were disabled or not. So we clearly identified that the legislative industry is and holds total prejudice against disabled people, and it's not surprising. 
let's have a look at disabled people in the UK. So only 6.6% of disabled people are identified as being physically active. And that's a huge number of people disabled living in the UK. I think the latest figure on this from um, the Office for National Statistics is that it's closer to £87 billion worth of disposable income a year. You can do the maths, work it out, so you'll be thinking, right, well, if I'm disabled, how much am I supposed to have on average to spend on anything I want? So of those disabled people who are in employment, only 3.5% of them are actually working in the leisure industry. At Aspire, 21 point, I don't know why I don't just round up to 22%, 21.9% of people working in our centre are disabled. So that's more than the national t statistic on, of those who are disabled <coughs> in our society. So we've tried to take what we do through a thing called the Destructibility Programme. So David Morphew that I pointed out earlier, he's been through this. We now train people, um, it's a pan-disability course, so it doesn't matter what disability you have, it's free, it's all funded, um, you're trained to pick up, um, again, fitness professional qualifications, you're supported in the leisure industry on a 12-week work placement. We've now got over 200 people through the programme, fully qualified, and over 50% have been offered permanent or taken up permanent employment. Of those who haven't, many have been so inspired, I know one um, spinal injured girl, she was so inspired, she thought, I'm not stopping here. I'm off to university, I've got a place already, I'm gonna become a physiotherapist. I mean, most people have been so, given so much confidence and belief in themselves that they're not stopping there. So hopefully, I know that I'm probably preaching to um, an audience that is already on board with this. And last slide, just <coughs> reminding you who I am. Um, this is uh, me with Michael Higgins, who's the president of Ireland, and the only reason that, that this is on here is because it's fun. I just think it's funny. <laughs> 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 and um, I'd, I was invited over to um, Tralee for the launch of, you think, wait for this one, the UNESCO, which is, everyone knows what UNESCO is, United Nations Education Social Cultural Organization, and they launched the Pro Professorial Chair in Inclusive Physical Education, Sports, Fitness, and Recreation. So I was there for the ceremony, and um, Michael Higgins was speaking at it to welcome it and congratulate UNESCO. So um, I don't just come along to support TREAT. Um, the last time I was speaking, it was supporting these guys as a UNESCO speaker in Marseille, but I guess there are similarities. Uh, it wasn't raining there, but they do have a harbour, and it was coastal and out to the sea. So thank you very much. Thank you.